Hallelujah. Glory to God. It may be cold on the outside, but it is warm on the inside. Because the greater one lives within us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, am I on? Testing, am I on now? Ah, okay. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay. One more time. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> and welcome to this service that's coming to you from Global Outreach Church in Lawrenceville, Georgia. We thank God for all of you that are in the house. And we pray for all of you that are warming up, cozying up in your beds, sipping coffee, latte, whatever it is. Don't forget us. Uh, we are praying for you as a matter of fact. Praise God. <laughs> We thank God for you. We love you. And we pray that at the appropriate time, God will give you the liberty to join us in person because we love you. We'd like to give you a hug in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me just begin this morning by first of all thanking God for my friend, Dr. Victor Ladokun, who ministered to us last Sunday. Yes. I was not here because I didn't think it would be appropriate for me to be in the service uh, knowing some of the things he may be talking about. Now, I don't know all of the message. I didn't know all of the message. Uh, but uh, uh, Victor had been very instrumental in the, in the decision that I had to make. Actually, it all began, it, it all began as we sat down to lunch uh, a while back. And uh, during lunch, we started talking back and forth. And he mentioned one or two things that just quickened me in my spirit uh, without him knowing what happened as a result of that lunch. So it was only appropriate for us to bring him in on Sunday, and he did an excellent job. Excellent job, for which I'm most grateful. Amen? And so I pray that God will continue to bless him and increase him and anoint him and take the message in his mouth across the regions beyond in Jesus' name. Okay, so we're here this morning, and as has been advertised, we're going to start a new series uh, called Wholeheartedly Living or Living Wholeheartedly. Now, this is the third week of this year. By now, many of you have heard from your favorite personal prophets. They've looked in their crystal ball. And they have told you many things concerning 2024. Usually, at the end of every year, you know, church, we, we, we're good at one thing. We know how to coin certain things. 2024, the year of God's abundance. 2024, the year of my breakthrough. 2024, the year of my uplifting. Now, I have no qualms with those things. Because indeed, those things do happen. But I just wonder, if we as a people, at the end of each year, will take an inventory and say, okay, the beginning of the year, my favorite prophet said that this is the year of my breakthrough. Did you break through or did you break down? Because in all of those faces, as good as they are, and I have no problems with them being snazzy and fancy. But we need to be asking, what's God's desire? What does God want to see happen in each of our lives? Besides me subscribing to my personal prophet that's giving me something that's making me feel good about myself. What did the creator who invested so much in giving his son for my sake, what does he want of me this year? In Exodus chapter 12, you don't have to turn to it. That's not my message. In verses 1 and 2, the Bible says that God spoke to Moses and Aaron to tell the children of Israel, verse 2, that this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first 
month of the year to you. That was God's word to Israel. When? Why did he say it? When did he say it? On the eve of their deliverance from Egypt. So my word to you this morning, which I believe came from God, or is coming from God, is that for each and every one of us as a part of this community, go church. And those of you watching us online, and all of our friends and families that's connected to us one way or the other, I believe God's word to us as a community is that we give ourselves to hold, uh, hold, hold, <laughs> wholehearted living. <laughs> God's challenge, what he wants to see happen in us in 2024 is to live wholeheartedly for him. Not chasing about vanities, fleeting moments that come today and disappear tomorrow. Wealth you cannot create that you have for a moment and it's gone next moment. Because the truth of the matter is, if we take God's word and really embrace it and invite him to help us and become a partner in us to live wholeheartedly for him, all of those things and more will come looking for you. You will not be looking for them. They will be looking for you. Amen? Merriam-Webster defines wholehearted as, number one, completely and sincerely devoted, determined, or enthusiastic. Number two, he it says it's marked by complete, earnest commitment, free from all reserve or hesitation. Wow. Let me repeat that again. Webster says wholehearted or being wholehearted means to be completely and sincerely devoted. Is that me and you this morning? Free from all reserve or hesitation. To be marked by complete and earnest commitment. Free from all reserve and hesitation. Now, the opposite of that word may help us to understand what God is trying to say to us from this week for the next several weeks. The opposite of being wholehearted is to be half-hearted. Or to have a divided heart. Some of you that's watching online, and maybe some of you that are here right now, you are here, you are hearing my voice, but you are thinking of Chelsea. If Liverpool is playing, you are really at Liverpool, not here. That is what a divided heart looks like. Your body is warming the seats or the sofa at home, but you are fidgeting. You are totally, completely distracted. You are not focused. Let me tell you what happened. In November 2004, I had an open heart surgery. I went in the hospital on Wednesday. The surgery took place on that Wednesday. I was discharged on Friday. Now, I will not wish the excruciating pain that I went through on even Lucifer. It was that painful. But this is what I learned in that process. After I got home, they told me that I should walk, exercise, so I can regain my strength. And I'll tell you what, just going into the shower, And turn the shower on. Just to turn it on. I felt like I had been in the ring with Mike Tyson. Exhausted. And then when the water drips all over me. And I finally turned it back off. I said, man. I almost need a chair to sit in that shower. To regain my strength. To get back up. 
I've not done it. All I did is take a shower. Then, when it's time to get dressed, and I say, okay, well, let, let me just get this shirt out of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the hanger and just pull this shirt out of my closet. Oh, what, what, what did I even think of that for? Things that you and I do that we don't think about. It's routine. It's normal. It's nothing to it. I mean, what's, what's into getting into your closet, getting a shirt and putting it on? Nothing. But when you have a heart that is going through a process of healing, every task becomes monumental. And you are reminded everything you try to do that you are not who. And as I went through that period, the scripture came to me. God reminded me of the scripture in Proverbs chapter 4, chapter 3. Attend unto my words. Incline my ears unto my, unto my sayings. Do not let them depart from your face. Keep them in your heart. It's life unto you and health and medicine to all your flesh. The next sentence. Keep your heart with all diligence. Because out of it, out of where? Your heart. Out of it are the issues, plural, of life. Whether it's your marriage, your jobs, your parenting, your businesses, your church activities, out of it, the heart, are the issues, plural, of life. If your heart is diseased, you are limited in what you can do. So God's word to us at the beginning of this year is living wholeheartedly to make sure you and I are laser focused on God, not on the stock market. On God, not your jobs. On Jehovah, not even your family. Now, let, let me qualify that. I don't want you to go home and say to your wife or your husband, I'm not, I'm not thinking about you. I'm focused on God. That's not the point. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, God becomes your priority. You heard a message here a while back about preference and priority. I'm challenging you. I'm bringing you into remembrance that in 2024, if you are going to really have a shot of joy in December, commit to living wholeheartedly. Now, let's go to the scripture. In 2 Chronicles chapter 25, in verses 2, well, just verse, verse 2 is good enough. I saw this scripture, it just, it blew me away. Second Chronicles 2, 25, 2. Amaziah, that's the king in Israel, did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, but not wholeheartedly. This is from the New Living Translation. Did, did, you, did you just hear what I just read to you? How does a man or a woman do that which is pleasing in God's sight? And yet God said, not wholeheartedly. He checked the boxes. Present, 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 present. For God looks on his side and says, <laughs> my friend, in a natural, you seem to be present, but your heart is diseased. Now, I don't have time to read more of that passage. You can read that on your own. When you read verses 14 through 16, you understand why God said, even though he did that which was pleasing in God's sight, but not wholeheartedly. You see the reason. This guy went to war. God gave him victory in the battlefield. In verses 14 through 16, he now brought back home I dogs from the nations he had conquered and began to bow down to them. 
And God sent a prophet to him. Say, said, Amaziah, have you lost your mind? The gods you are bowed down to could not save the people out of your hand. The God you are worshipping could not deliver the people that you just defeated. Now you're going to bring these same idols to your home, to your country, and begin to bow down and worship. But what is wrong with you? Now, for me and you, it may not be that dramatic. But if truth be told, we need to ask ourselves the questions, what is stealing our passion for God? What is it that's interfering with me and you living wholeheartedly for God? What have we given our affection to? What, or rather, what has stolen our affection? Now, I said to you what Webster said about the definition of being wholehearted, completely and sincerely devoted, determined, enthusiastic, marked by completion and commitment, free from all reserve or hesitation. But that's not the only meaning. That's not the only meaning of that word. The scripture gives us the best definition of being wholehearted. In the book of Numbers, we're going to go there in a minute. Let me just give you the background before we go there. In the book of Numbers 13, do you recall the story? Many of us know the story of how God delivered Israel out of Egypt and gave them the promised land and said to them, this land I've given you because of my covenant and commitment to Abraham. He now said to them in Numbers 13, Send us spies. Let them go to the promised land. Let them go check it out. To bring you verification. Because I know I'm dealing with humanity. You see, you only go by what you can see. So send men out there to spy the line so they can bring you verification that what I've told you indeed is true. That the place indeed flows with milk and honey. So they went. And came back, we are told in Numbers 13, with a bad report. But what I'm about to read to you now in a minute is to help me and you understand the meaning from the scriptures of being wholehearted. God made a clear distinction between the children of God on the one hand and Joshua and Caleb on the other hand. Now let's go to the story. Numbers 14, verse 11. Numbers 14, 11. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe me? In spite of all the signs I have performed among them. Verse, no, not verse. Numbers 32. So you hear what God said in Numbers 14, 11. Numbers 32, verses 11 and 12 in the NIV. By the way, this is all NIV. Numbers 32, verse 11 and 12. God says, because they have not followed me, what? Wholeheartedly. Say that with me. Say wholeheartedly. Say wholeheartedly. So God is making a distinction between the general population of the children of Israel and Joshua and Caleb. And what's God's point? This first scripture we read in Numbers 14, 11, what did God said the problem was? They didn't believe him. He said, they did not believe me. Even though I gave them signs and wonders, they did not believe me. And the book of Hebrews confirmed this. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. Unbelief. But now, in Numbers 32, verse 11 and 12, he said, because they have not followed me wholeheartedly, not one of those who were 20 years old or more, when they came out of Egypt, we see the promised land, we see the land that promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 12. Not one except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for what? They followed the Lord. How? Ah, uh, no, 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 you didn't say it like you. Did you see it? For they followed the Lord how? 
Listen, I thank God for Miriam Webster. I thank God for all the English definitions. They are correct, just incomplete. The scripture is always the best interpretation for any word in the Bible. Here in the passage you just read is the first mention of the word wholehearted. First time ever. God was the first one that inspired that word and placed it in the scripture. And so, when we follow the first mention principles of scripture, the first mention principle always has encapsulated within the seed, within the word, the complete total meaning that you find later on in all of scriptures. So when God said this back in Numbers, the first time he ever used the word, we see the context in which it was used. And that context reveals the fact that God's dissatisfaction with them was the fact that they did not what? Believe. So what am I saying to us so far? I'm saying to us so far in 2024, that believing God is a priority. Ah, thank you, Brother Tunde. Thank you, Pastor Tosin. The rest of you guys, let, let me yell it out to you again. I'm, I'm saying that in 2024, believing God Amen. is a priority. Amen. Now, it sounds very simplistic. But as we take the journey, you will see the implications. I mean, if I was to take a poll now, how many of us believe God? Everybody's hand will go up. Everybody. But notice, God is not just saying, uh, for, for, the, for the ten of those leaders who went out to spy the land, they didn't come back and say, we didn't believe God. No, that was not their testimony. Just as none of us here today, or listening by air, or streaming, None of us will say today, we don't believe God. No. But our daily living, our daily decisions, our daily choices will reveal whether we believe God or not. Let me just take you to the back room. When God first began to deal, to deal with my wife and I about the uh, what I announced to you uh, first Sunday in, in January. I called uh, the church attorney who had been a lawyer for years. For I don't know how many years now. Dale Allison. He's been, he's, been a, he's been a lawyer, consultant in this ministry over 20 something years. He was introduced to us by Dr. Mark Hamby. So when I share with him what I'm thinking, what I was thinking to do, Wanted to get some cancer for, and he's, he's a solid believer, by the way. Solid. Not, not this, uh, what you call, bare weather Christians. No, 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 no. Solid. And as I began to share with him what God was laid on my heart, he listened to me carefully. This was in April, I remember. And began to give me counsel. I said, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, you need to do that. Now, you must understand I've had a relationship with this man for years, spanning all over 20 years. So when I was talking to him, his entire goal and, 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 and what shall I say, is, is, he was concerned to make sure that whatever I did, I am protected. So he began to tell me, okay, you need to do this, you need to do that, uh, you need to stay on for this many more years, don't do this, don't do that. Counsel that is not ungodly, but because I know what God has said to me and because I recognize that even at the age of 70, I don't ever want to slack off not trusting God. I want to trust God into my grave. He was trying to protect me and I, I listened to him. I did not argue with him because it would have been impolite for me to do so. When I hung up the phone, God said to me, Bank, who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust the machinations of man? And Bank, if you were to die and I call you home, would you come from 
grave to make sure that the things you are putting in place will stand. I'm sharing with you what happened. We're talking about believing God and trusting Him in 2024. And then God took me to the scriptures. You see, it's not just good for you to hear. Test every spirit to know if it be from God. So I'm not asking you to just take what I'm saying. No, you, you need to be like the Berean Christian. Go home, dig through the scriptures, search it, make sure it's right. And if I'm saying something that is wrong, discard it. God took me to Genesis. He said, he said, he created Adam, Adam and Eve. Is that correct? I said, yes, of course you created Adam and Eve. What kind of a question is that? And then he said to me, did I, Jehovah God, did I know, did I have advanced knowledge that Adam and Eve will fail in the garden? He said, of course. <laughs> like Ezekiel, that knows all things, of course. Then God said, did I take any precaution to make sure they don't fail? My goodness. God said to me, because could God have done that? Yes. When you were trying to get the, uh, the, the fruit of the, from the tree, God, the alarm could have gone, go, 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 don't do it. God, he didn't do that. He said, did I do that? Did I safeguard their ability to make a choice? I said, no, you did not. So God said, arrest my case. He arrested his case and arrested my case. So I told the guy, scratch this, scratch that, scratch this, scratch that, scratch this, scratch that. If God don't protect me, I don't need to be protected. Except the Lord build a house. They labor in vain that do it. I do not want to spend the rest of my days laboring in vain. And I pray that's the same for you. Not at all. 2024. It's <laughs> a season to trust God at the new level. Trust Him with your life. Trust Him with your household. Trust Him with your businesses. Trust Him with your career. And yes, trust Him with your finance. You see, the ten spies saw the obstacles in the promised land as insurmountable. Wow. Joshua and Caleb saw it as insignificant. Let, let, let me tell you something here. There is no promise of God to you and I that will go unchallenged. You didn't hear me? Go search the scriptures. Anytime God gives a command or a promise, you can be rest assured that promise will be challenged. But the challenge is not to take you under. The challenge is to grow you bigger. Always. Always. Ask Joseph about it. God gave me a dream. He spoke at the dream. The Bible tells us that until the word of the Lord came through, the Lord tested him. Jesus, God spoke over him. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Really? Wilderness is waiting. So as I'm speaking this to you now, I'm acutely aware that we just unleashed significant warfare for, of which we are adequately qualified in Christ because Jesus has already, what? Defeated, canceled, annulled, placed the devil in his place, and therefore you and I should not be afraid of any warfare. Be strong in the Lord, the Bible says, and in the power of his might, not your might or my might. Okay? So all those ten spies that came back with unbelieving bad report, does anybody remember any of, any of their names? Let's do a pop quiz. Can, can you call any of the names of those ten? In all of your naming ceremonies, have you named any child after any of those ten? No. No. History has forgotten them. Why? Because they didn't trust God. 
may history not forget you in Jesus' name. May you leave the trails of your footsteps on the blazing, on the sand of this earth because you took a position and because you trusted God with your life. I can count the names Joshua. I can count the names Caleb. Where's the rest of those guys? They don't exist. So be careful. Ah. I know I only have a few minutes left. On my first day back, I don't want to blow up the clock. So let me, let me behave myself. In Numbers 14, in verse 3 and verse 31, Numbers 14, verse 3 and verse 31, this is what the scripture says. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? I mean, I'm talking to a lot of immigrants here. And for those of us who are African Americans, yes, at one point we were also immigrants. I stood at the shore of Cape Coast in Accra, Ghana, and saw how they shipped us on the slave boat to bring us to this country. So all of us have the same rich heritage. But the point is, are we like those people, the Israelites, going to say today, will it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Please, don't, don't, don't miss their concern. Why did they not trust God? Why? Why did they not believe God? What was their main concern? our wives, and our children. You are missing it. Oh, God, Father, help me to help them to get it. The reason many of us today do not trust God in our lives, in our finance, in our career, in our job, whatever, we do, the reason is the same reason. Who will take care of my family? What will be left for my children? As if those children belong to you. Can you manufacture a child? Children, we are told, are heritage of the Lord our God. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. The children you are agonizing over belong to God. How in the world do you think you can change the plight of the, li the life of your children apart from God? You better cast your cares upon, upon the Lord. And let God take care of what you are incapable of doing. Humble yourself and admit and acknowledge without God I will perish. Simple. That was their complaint. Oh God, we're going to go to Canaan. There are Anax there. Giants are there. If we go, who will take care of my wife? Look, at my, look how beautiful my wife is. Look at the, 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 the boots she's wearing. Look at, look at that sweater. Who will I leave this beautiful woman for? Ha, go on, I'll go. Hey, look, look at the madame. Who, I mean, she, on and on and on and on. You see, we may not articulate it like that. But they factor it factors into our conscience, and that's why we make the wrong decisions. Living wholeheartedly, unreserved commitment. They were afraid of their children, of their wives, of their family. Now remember, this guy just came out of slavery. How, how quick are we to forget? I was talking to my brother yesterday. I said, Kunle, I said, at this point in my life, I have nothing but, 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 but thanksgiving to God. And it's the truth. In 1972, when I left Nigeria, my, the sum total of my possession was $300. 300 US dollars that someone actually gave me. My father could not afford it. Professor Olumbe Basia of the University of Ibado, who was a friend of my father, heard I was traveling. And he came to my father's house and gave me three. $100 traveler's checks. After my father bought the ticket, 
Say, Jack, you're on your own. <laughs> so I was selling, I said, I said, can you imagine? $300. A mega investment of $300. Look what God has done with me today. <laughs> The truth is, the story is similar for many of us. Some of you got here with $10. Others with $100. Maybe some of you with more. But the point I'm making is this. Would you now turn your back to the God who's changed your situation? How much would you give to this God? Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. How much can we offer you for your goodness unto the children of man? And then we get a job and we don't acknowledge and understand that it's God that provided the job. And we begin to worship a job rather than worship God. I read a story the other day of a man who made $100 every week. And as long as he was making $100 a week, he had no problem giving God $10. Soon enough, Hundred dollars became two hundred. He said, "I give me twenty out of the two hundred. After a while, he started making three hundred a week. He had no problem giving thirty. Now all of a sudden, he started making a thousand dollars, and he got jittery and scared. He went to his pastor. I said, Pastor, when I was making hundred dollars, I had no problem giving ten. When I was making two hundred, 20 was fine, I could give it. Now I'm making a thousand. Please pray for me so I can give at least 100. Pastor said, No problem. Let's pray. I pray for God to take you back to where you make $100. <laughs> and the man said, I have faith. No, I have faith. I have faith. I believe. That's our story. You've forgotten so quickly where God brought you from. And you are not able to give honor to whom honor is due. So in verse 31, Numbers 14, verse 31, this is what God said. As for your children that you said will be taken as plunder, I will bring them into, to enjoy the land you have rejected. So the children you are complaining about, God says, don't worry. I got their back. But you, the complainer, you will not see it. Ah, no, no, no. See, I don't, see, this, this, this quick someone else will give you. I don't have time to really, to, to really glean this thing. Don't you recognize you have what you say? You have what you say. Many of us right now are the product of the things we said out of our mouth. And then you are looking for a, 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 a pastor to work magic and change your lifestyle with one prayer. When you spend a lifetime speaking bad, negative, dead words. Life and death! Ask the power of the town. What are you speaking over your children? You wake up in the morning, you crazy child. Hey. When he starts acting crazy, don't blame him, blame yourself. Paul said to us in Colossians 4, 6 that we should, in our conversation, speak words uh, that, that are with grace. Seasoned with salt. Because you shape your life and the lives of those around you with your mouth. So these guys, on that day, had the audacity to challenge and accuse God. You are taking us to the promised land. Which promised land is that? Where is it on the map? Can I Google it? Can I, can I search for it on Google? Promised land. Uh, we are their giants. The sons of Enoch. Nephilims are there. For what? For apple. Apple. Uh, apple. <laughs> can, can you imagine that conversation? Abed, let's go back to Egypt. At least we know they are licks and garlic. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Because our children and our wives... 
they be exposed. God said, don't worry. You've spoken it. You have it. All of them died. Every last word. God didn't kill them. They killed themselves. Because the power of life and tongue, life, life and death is in the tongue. Very quickly. Let me bring this to your close. I know, I know the clock is out. Okay. All the clock police, thank you very much. I see your signals. Okay. <laughs> Two facts that are often ignored about killing. Number one. Number one. Caleb was of a Gentile heritage. He was not even a Jew. <laughs> Confession? I only just saw this myself yesterday. Ah, pastor, are you just making this up? Okay. Students of the word. Numbers 32, give it to me, please. Verse 12. Numbers 32, verse 12. Not one except Caleb. Who is he? The son of Jephunneh. The what? Kenizzites. Who are the Kenizzites? The ones whom God promised Abraham in Genesis 15 verse 19. Go to Genesis 15 verse 19. Quickly, 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 please. Thank you very much, guys. You guys are doing a good job. You guys are doing a good job. Genesis 15. Okay. Part of the line that God promised Abraham was the line of the who? The Kenites and the Kenizzites. You know all those ites? Amalekites, Canaanites. Caleb was a direct descendant of those ites. Oh my God. There's too much here. Do you guys give me 10 minutes? If you don't give it, I'll take it. <laughs> I hope you guys are you guys are there on Tuesday when they're dealing with me on this on this. <laughs> no, no, but, but seriously, on a very serious note, I don't. I just want to leave you hanging because I want to drive home a point. So we know from Scripture that he is a Kenizzite. In Acts ten thirty four, what did Peter say when he went to the house of Cornelius? He said, I know of, 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 I know for a fact that God is more partial. Oh my God. God! Then Peter began to speak. I know or realize how true it is that God is not or does not show favoritism or partiality. What am I talking about? I don't know if you remember in Exodus, when Israel left Egypt. The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 12, I'm, I'm not going to read it, chapter 12 verse 38, that a mixed multitude went away them. And anyone who was proselyte um, turned to accept the Israeli religion, God accepted them. It's not a respectable person. So Caleb's descendancy, his heritage, was a of Ephesians Paul tells us in verse 14 to 15 that God from two men made a new man. I, I don't have time to, to, to really milk that for you. Talk about the Jews and the Gentiles. How God has made peace between both of them. And from those two Gentiles and Jews, what did he do? He made a new man. Okay? What's the point I'm making? God will not allow just the Jews to enjoy the promised land except they bring us in. From way back, we had a representative by the name of Caleb. The point of this whole thing is in these two things I'm trying to show you, you see how faithful God is. That even though this guy was a Gentile, way back, but because he trusted God. I am saying to you in 2024, if you switch 
and to kill your divided heart and begin to trust God and believe God. What God did with Caleb, he will do for you. He's faithful. And his faithfulness is not biased on your race, creed, uh, gender, or none of that. He's faithful. Second thing, and this is where I'm going to close. The two things we ignore about Caleb. Number one, that he was a Gentile. Number two, the meaning of his name. The meaning of his name. Caleb means dog. Dog, like a bulldog. A dog. God has a sense of humor. You, you, you do understand. Because back in those days, to be a dog, is, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not fun. Or to be called a dog. That's the worst thing you can say to anybody of Jewish heritage. A dog. What? Dog. Oh. Of course, over years and time, that has changed. They take care of pets. They love dogs like anybody else. But if for the purpose of this message, let me close on this. Because we know that the meaning of a man's name in the scriptures always has something to do with their character. So what's the message God is giving us when he said Caleb is a dog? Or his name means a dog. Number one. Number one. I know this from my experience. Tony brought a dog to our home, home years ago. A dog called Oscar. Everybody thought I was a mean, mean, mean African because I didn't particularly like dogs. And I'm not saying that dogs are not good, so no, please understand what I'm saying. I'm just not the kind that really, uh, the, the dog, anyway, you, you, you see, let, let, let me just get into the story. Number one thing about a dog. A good dog has a desire to be near their master. Everywhere I went, you see my wife, see Tony, see, this dog don't bother, they don't. Everywhere I went, if I sat down, the guy would come and sit down and say, oh, God, what's, what's your problem? Somehow, this dog recognized I was the head of the home and that whatever else happens in the household, he needs to win my affection. So a, a dog has a desire to be near his master. Is that your desire this morning? Do you want to be near your master, Jesus? Because I was Caleb. He's a dog. And he wants to be near his master. He wants to fulfill his master's heart. He wants to be where Jesus is. That's number one. Number two. A dog will follow you wherever you're going. This is Oscar for a dog. If I decide to go and take a walk. I, I, I didn't invite him. Uh, it's, it's not as if I say, Oscar, I'm, no, no. He sees me getting dressed, going to the gym. It's, it's ready. It's ready. And he will not ask you, where are you going? How long will you be there? Will I go? None of that concerns him. As long as he's with you. Is that your affection for, is that how your affection for Jesus is? Are you willing to go wherever Jesus goes? Are you willing to follow him to the ends of the earth? We just finished praying for the nations. Are you willing to go? If you are not, your heart is not whole yet. Because a dog will follow you or the master wherever they want to go. Number three. Ah, this is a good one. Dogs, they walk by faith and not by sight. Let me explain that. Many of us have traveled. We've gone abroad. We come back. When you get to U.S. customs, what do you see? They bring a dog. The dog is not looking to see anything. Because their eyesight is poor. So they don't find drugs or, or, or contraband by what they see. How do they do it? They sniff it out. But they are not going to say, I'm not going because I can't see. Many of us are waiting to see something to do something. That's not Caleb. That's not a man or a woman whose heart is whole. If you wait to see before you do, it's too late. There's a reason why innovators, people that made money in dot-com era, there's a reason they made the money. They have not seen what's going to happen, but they heard the prospect. 
They read about it. And they said, man, there's a prospect here. I'm going to invest in Amazon. I'm going to invest in Next Flip. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. When it was not popular, they put their money there. While you and I are still struggling, we're just sweating. Still sweating. Ah, sweating. You're praying. You say, open your eyes and see what's going on. The people who get there first make the most money. And then laggers. After all the money is made, you're now coming behind. Can you imagine? If you bought cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, 10 years ago, when it was 20 cents, uh, $20. Per Bitcoin. Now the thing is selling for $1,000. 10, 20 years ago, ah, cryptocurrency. I don't believe in it. You don't have to believe in it. Don't be, fine, don't believe in it. Talk for yourself. Ah, I don't believe in it. Those that do and put their money there, what are they doing? They are laying on the beach in Barbados. <laughs> Down the beach. Where did they just come from? Tahiti. <laughs> While you are slaving to what to walk, I go to go to go to walk. Because you have to see to believe. That's not how dogs work. Number four thing about dogs. They are dogged. They have tenacity. This Oscar of a dog, I shut my door. It, it, it will park in front of the door. If I ever open that door, it's there. I said, what, what's wrong with this dog? And if I open the door, it crack. It comes in and hides under my bed. That dog, to it tortured me. <laughs> no, no kidding. And they said, Daddy, don't just play with it. Just rub his head. I said, well, I don't want to rub his head. I mean, is that it? <laughs> they don't give up. Caleb will not give up. And you're going to see next week what happened as a result of that tenacity. And lastly, because I need to close it, every good thing comes to an end. So they give me another chance to preach again. A good dog is taught to wait at the command of their master. A good dog is taught to wait at the command of their master. I see my wife do this all the time. They get a piece of candy or dog food. Oscar, sit down. And the guy will just sit down there on his stool and he'll be shaking. He'll be shaking. Ah. He, he's seen it and he'll be shaking. Every system in his body says, go, get it, get it, get it. But out of restraint, out of restraint, he's been taught to just wait. Even though everything in his body is screaming, don't wait, snatch it, just take it. No, you just sit down there. He, he, he's, he, he's, he's still be wagging his mouth. I said, ah, what, what, what kind of torture is this? He just, and then they give him one. He'll he snuck it. And then sit down, Oscar. He'll sit down again. What's the point? If you are going to live wholeheartedly, you and I must learn to wait. We must learn to wait on God. Even when everything is all in us is screaming, bang, go for it. Sharon, get it. Ah, oh, Greg, do it. The Caleb anointing. And a man or woman who's learned to live wholeheartedly before God will recognize that God is the controller. Hallelujah. And those that wait upon the Lord. Mm. There is a blessing to wait. I said, Father, this morning, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for your challenge to us in 2024. To live wholeheartedly before you. Lord, to not be divided in our attention, divided in our focus, divided in our priority, that you, God, will become the sole priority that at your command we go out. At your command we come in. At your command we sit. At your command we stand. That whatsoever we will engage in, surely God will be that which you are moving upon us to do. And Lord God, that no aspect of our lives 
will be taken away from you, will be, will, will, be, will be reserved for us and not for you. My Lord and my God, in Jesus' name, I thank you for our homes. I thank you for our families. I thank you for our children. I thank you for our businesses, our careers, our studies. Everything that we're involved in, Lord God, we invite you to fully take charge and take control. We relinquish that control to you now because you are an able keeper. You are able to keep that which we commit to you. And so, Lord, thank you. Release your grace upon us. Afresh, afresh and anew this morning. Grace to trust you. Grace to stand. Grace to believe you. Thank you, Father God, that we do not return back to our own vomit. Because we recognize it's not by, power, by might, not by power, but by your spirit. Holy Spirit, we bless you, we thank you. Now and forever, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We pick it up from there next week. So right now, we're just going to uh, ask that we worship God in our substance. Let's bless the Lord and just give him what's due as an act of worship, act of gratitude. I don't want to give you 15 scriptures. If God has been good to you, be good back to him. Be good back to him. Be good back to him. Tell God you appreciate what he's done in your life. Let him know how much you appreciate him. And yes, start trusting God even now with your finances. Let, that, let this be a reset button for you. Stop tipping God. Stop tipping God. Let your finance be the starting point right now. This is the first opportunity you have to live wholeheartedly. Release your finance to God. Why? All silver and all gold, it belongs to him. He's the owner of the cattle on a thousand hills. Amen? That job you have, you think it's your qualification that got it? No, it's God's favor. Honor him, bless him, and watch him do wonders in life. And so, Father God, we want to thank you for the privilege to be able to worship you in our giving. We thank you, Lord God, for these blessings, and we honor you because we recognize everything we have and everything we are is of you in Jesus' name. Amen. There you go on the screen, all the means of giving. God bless you, and we'll see you this time next week in Jesus' name.